Good morning, everyone. Apologies for the late start. We were downstairs having a breakfast, and when you pull together great minds to talk about this, it's really hard for us to stop. Um, so forgive us for that. Uh, my name is Kimberly Flowers, and I'm the director of global food security here at CSIS, but I'm also the director of the humanitarian agenda, which is what this conversation is a part of today. The humanitarian agenda is really a center-wide effort where CSIS is, is looking at humanitarian assistance and linking it up to large foreign policy solutions. And very specifically, we're going to be looking at access issues and what kind of policy solutions can actually help aid reach the most vulnerable. When thinking about South Sudan, we wanted to, to dive a little bit deeper into this from a very technical perspective to sort of explore this and look at how you know, whether you're a humanitarian practitioner or a humanitarian at heart, it's pretty easy to see why South Sudan is something we want to talk about. The, the people there have had a horrific and tra traumatic toll in their lives for, for multitudes of decades. And the U.S. government, as well as many other donors, have, have poured in a lot of money on this. And we want to really take a look to see um, what's been effective, what's not. So we've pulled together some of the best minds for that today. Um, as someone who focuses a lot on global hunger issues, that's my area of expertise and interest. You know, when I look at South Sudan, of course, I'm thinking about that over half of the population is facing extreme food insecurity this year. Last year, we talked a lot about four famines, meaning four countries that were on the brink of famine. But the fact was that only South Sudan had famine officially declared, and only in two counties, and that had been lifted after a few months. But the point is, is that even if it doesn't have an official famine declaration. It does not mean that the people there are not safe or nourished. Um, it's very hard to even understand the data points uh, when we're looking at a conflict zone. Uh, the other thing I just want to point out is when we look at humanitarian assistance, no matter where you're coming at from that lens, um, it's changed a lot in the last few decades. You know, today, humanitarian actors, humanitarian you know, aid workers are predominantly working in man-made conflicts. Notice it's never woman-made conflicts, but in man-made conflicts, it's not the same as responding to a natural disasters. And so you, what you have in protracted humanitarian crises today is how that conflict affects, affects the whole spectrum of assistance from the political realities to the on-the-ground frontline negotiations. And that's some of the elements that we want to talk about today, is how you operate in that insecure environment. And for our keynote speaker today, we, we could not ask for a better person to really represent the role of the U.S. State Department um, and how it interacts in terms of humanitarian leadership, as well as the importance of the influence of career foreign service officers, particularly in the political climate that we have today. Um, Ambassador Molly Fee has extensive experience in East Africa, the Middle East, as well as with the United Nations. Um, most importantly relevant to this discussion was she was the U.S. Ambassador to South Sudan from 2015 to 2017. Uh, more recently, she was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of International Organization Affairs. Um, her prominent postings, it'll be long if I list them all, but let me say a few. Um, she, uh, in, in her public servant career, she has been the Deputy Chief of Mission in Ethiopia, the Director for Iraq at the National Security Council, and the Deputy Security Council Coordinator at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. Ambassador Fee, the stage is yours. All right, I have multiple microphones here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out to discuss uh, this very difficult and tragic uh, situation. And thank you to Kimberly and to CSIS and to USAID uh, for focusing on this uh, very important topic. I think this conversation is long overdue, and I'm delighted uh, to have been given the opportunity to participate. I think it's important at the start, and I'm sort of surprised um, that I have to say this, but I, I do want to say this. We are all here, uh, I think everyone, I presume, who is participating in this conversation and those uh, who've come to, to talk about this, this problem set, uh, because we care deeply about the people of South Sudan uh, who are uh, tragic victims of this uh, conflict uh, for which there appears to be no end in sight. Um, so I want to emphasize that 
that that undergirds the discussion, that everybody is looking for a way uh, to help the situation get better. Uh, so when we talk about this important intersection of humanitarian assistance and this very uh, difficult political situation with this protra protracted conflict, we are uh, not challenging the fundamental assumption that we as the United States have long been the most generous country in the world in terms of humanitarian assistance and in particular have long been uh, generous to the people of South Sudan and remain the largest donor. Um, so I I think that's important to emphasize because we need to ask difficult questions about uh, the role of the United States in this conflict, the role of um, assistance in this conflict, and is there a way that we can adjust the way we provide humanitarian assistance that means we're more effective in helping uh, the civilians, um, which fundamentally would mean an end uh, to the conflict because that, in fact, is what is creating this humanitarian crisis. So I thought I would give you a, a brief anecdote of something I tried to do when I was ambassador, uh, which I hope will set the stage for some of the problems that we're dealing with. So in 2016, uh, when we were trying um, uh, to implement the peace agreement, and we at that time had some hope uh, that with the return of opposition leader, uh, Dr. Riyak Mashar, uh, that he would be able to work with President Salva Kiir uh, and uh, begin to move the country forward and, uh, and out of the conflict. So as, um, uh, as he was returning, I engaged in conversations with the leadership of South Sudan and ultimately with both President Salva and with Dr. Riyak about this great idea I had as a naive American. So one of the reasons South Sudan uh, d delivery of humanitarian assistance is so expensive is because they have terrible infrastructure. Um, and so there's, uh, we have to often fly in assistance. So what we don't use is what I call God's highway, which is the White Nile, which runs through uh, South Sudan. And so if you think about it, it um, if you think from Juba, uh, to Bor, so from Equatoria to Jungle, Bor is a, a Dinka-dominated area, Juba is in the heartland of Equatoria, and then the White Nile goes up through Unity uh, and then enters Upper Nile. So what I suggested to these gentlemen is that uh, WFP had a lot of assistance up at the top of the country, if you think of the northeast part of the country up near Rank, where they could bring in assistance from Host in Sudan and um, there were barges. So we could have a barge that could come down and go uh, through Upper Nile where there are Shilla communities uh, and Nuer communities, come down through Unity, predominantly Nuer, go to Bor, predominantly Dinka, and come to Juba. So if the two men could instruct their militaries to cease the attacks which had made the river, and still is, the river is impassable uh, and because of insecurity, so we would be able to use this incredible natural highway um, and send a signal, they could send a signal to the country that they were um, ready to make peace, they were ready to move forward, and they were going to help all, the, all of their communities. So I, of course, was really enthusiastic about this idea, talked to a lot of people, talked to the leadership. So what do you think happened with, with that idea? Nothing, okay? No one even said, oh, you're a dumb idealistic American, but we get what you're trying. This, this is a way to do this that would be better in our system or whatever. They were not interested in using the peace agreement to, uh, create, a, to create an environment where they could address the concerns of their people. Um, th there are other options we had. There were uh, t small tractors in Juba that we could have put on barges and brought up um, to give to communities like in Malakal, uh, where they could have begun farming, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, that little anecdote sums up the challenge that we're dealing with. We're dealing with the leadership on um, uh, both uh, the government uh, and the primary leader of the opposition, uh, which is now uh, quite fragmented, who didn't have the same concerns that everybody in this room has about how do you end this conflict and how do you help your citizens. Um, so to me, it illustrates some of the challenges uh, that have developed in the unique, South, what I think is unique to South Sudan based on the history of the conflict and the history of US involvement. And I'll just run through a few of those. What you see in South Sudan is a culture of impunity. Um, so no matter what they do, they think the West will provide aid. 
So they can kill humanitarian workers, they can detain them, uh, they can extort money from, um, from primarily, it's primarily the West, so not exclusively the West that provides uh, humanitarian assistance. Um, they can prevent access um, and uh, basically uh, we, we continue to show up and continue to try and, and assist. Um, there's also a, a very dangerous culture of dependency. Uh, and any senior US leader, uh, whether Republican or Democratic administration, recent or uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, Congress, uh, anybody who's shown up in South Sudan has said, this situation is not sustainable, you must make peace, um, please look around the world, you know, 60 to 70 million refugees and IDPs, uh, d uh, competing conflicts, uh, we can't sustain this level of effort. You need to begin to clean up uh, this situation in order for us to work with you, for, in order for us for, to sustain support for this assistance. You need to do better. And the leaders of this country just look at American leadership and say, well, you've always provided us aid. You have to continue to provide us aid. Um, so I've never seen anything like that in my career. They, they, that is literally the reaction and it's a sincere reaction. They just presume that because we've been doing it for decades, we're gonna just continue to do, to do it. Um, I think a very important factor um, which makes it very complicated to solve this problem is what I call the sociological damage of the conflict. Um, we're dealing with people who have um, been engaged in violent behavior and com political conflict uh, amongst themselves, a political competition amongst themselves for decades. Um, within this society, um, as you've seen, you know, civil wars are, tend to be the most vicious and most violent. We've seen the most horrific kind of rape. Uh, we see terrible malnutrition, uh, terrible stunting, uh, terrible loss of educational opportunities. Um, so the society has really, whether it's, it's the most um, sort of marginal individual or the leadership, has been profoundly affected by the decades of conflict and it makes it much harder to work with them, uh, much harder to work, move forward. Um, and, I, and we've seen this in other conflicts, but it's particularly true in, in South Sudan, in my opinion, the weaponization of aid. Um, and so that can be as simple as, um, uh, using aid as revenue, we're basically the largest external source of, of assistance to the country through, through our humanitarian assistance. Uh, it can be blocking your opponents from receiving um, assistance. It can be diverting aid to supporters. Um, it can be use, using civilians, vulnerable civilians as bait, uh, which I've seen happen. Um, and uh, in, I did a, uh, some analysis with my great uh, OFTA partner in South Sudan. We looked at OCHA data for 2015, and OCHA is the, um, the UN acronym for the Coordinating Humanitarian Assistance Body, uh, and they try and track um, obstacles to delivery of assistance. And it was basically approximately 30% of the problems were from the government, 30% were from the opposition, and 30% um, uh, were uh, criminality. Um, and that was, that was an, our analysis in 2016 of the 2015 data. And I would presume those sort of rough um, proportions are probably um, uh, still, still current today, although you'd have to look at the, at the current data. But so, that, so that's what you're dealing with the problem set. So, so a society where the economy is destroyed, so there's a lot of rampant criminality, of course there's no security, um, and then um, all of the uh, actors um, uh, at some point using aid in, in some way. Um, so I, I just wanted to lay that context for you so we could open up a discussion about sort of options for the way forward. Um, and I'd like to offer one from my perspective, which I think is the most important. I think we need to remember that we, again, as I said at the outset, we are the largest donor. Um, and we have a responsibility, I think, to try and work with our implementing partners and with other donors to seek um, a, a collective um, approach uh, to the problems of access. Uh, the government still retains primary control of the country and in, 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 um, has the largest uh, impact, I think. Uh, that's not to say that the opposition doesn't control certain parts of the territory and uh, that the opposition is also tends to be somewhat splintered. Um, but I think we need to see unity of effort 
And I think it needs to come from capitals uh, to protect the vulnerable people on the ground. Uh, and I think it can't just be from donor agencies. They have to be backed by their governments, uh, given uh, sort of a donor focus on humanitarian uh, impact, um, which sort of complicates this discussion in the sense that there's a suggestion that if you try and do things differently, you're going to hurt um, the uh, uh, outreach to civilians. Uh, so to me, that I, I can we can talk about it during the panel. Um, I have seen uh, myself examples of where we've unified uh, as, a, as an international community and we've been able to have influence. And when we don't remain unified, uh, we become weaker and more vulnerable. So to me, that is the single greatest change we could make in terms of adapting our approach uh, to humanitarian assistance and, and delivery. And that's something that we should work on. And we should say, we are not, we don't find it acceptable in trying to help vulnerable people that the people who are trying to do that are murdered. We don't find it acceptable that they are detained. I do not find it credible, which I have said to the leaders of South Sudan, that they tell me that NRC, which is the Norwegian Refugee Council, the ICRC, WFP, premier names in humanitarian assistance, also World Vision, CRS, that those people, which I've been told, are trying to enact a political agenda. And that's why they deserve to be detained and harassed. Right? That's not credible to me, and it shouldn't be credible to anybody else. Um, so I think we need to say we, we, uh, we need a better environment uh, for our uh, delivery of humanitarian assistance, and we need to do it in partnership uh, with our other donor, uh, donor, other donor communities. And again, I don't think it can just be the development agencies. It needs to be the development agencies backed by their, by their governments. So anyway, I hope that's a, a helpful, if not sobering, uh, introduction. And I want to thank CSIS again for including me in this conversation, which is so very important. Uh, and let me close again by emphasizing um, that we have always uh, had solidarity with the people of South Sudan. And I hope that if we can improve our effectiveness in engaging with them, we'll be able to sustain that commitment for the people of South Sudan. Thank you. Okay, I am Deputy Director and uh, Research Fellow here at CSIS in the Project on Prosperity and Development. I uh, really appreciate you taking your time and, and coming out here to talk about this important topic. And, and thanks to Ambassador Fee for those excellent framing remarks. I think you, you posed a lot of very interesting questions. Uh, before we get to the distinguished panel that we have before us, I wanted to make a, a couple points. Um, one is that we were expecting to have uh, Luca Kuhl join us on the panel, and unfortunately the visa gods are against him, and he is stuck in Senegal right now. Uh, it's really unfortunate. I was really looking forward to having, um, and I think we were all looking forward to, to having his voice on here. So I'm going to call an audible, a think tank audible, and make an offer to Luca to podcast him and uh, really continue this conversation with him because I think his voice is really uh, critical um, uh, and, and I, I just wanted to acknowledge that. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, our participants online, uh, including those uh, in South Sudan. I hope that the internet gods are playing uh, nicely with you and, and that you are able to live stream this. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and, and we really appreciate uh, your time as well. Lastly, I wanted to thank the U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, who has been partnering with the humanitarian agenda led by Kimberly. This is a really unique, first of its kind, uh, big CSIS-wide effort, and the Project on Prosperity and Development is really honored to, to be uh, working with Kimberly and her team uh, on, this, on this important uh, event. That's enough from me. Um, I, uh, come at this conversation as, as someone who lived in South Sudan uh, in the Equatorias, but also in Upper Nile pre and post um, independence. I care very deeply and I, I really appreciate how Ambassador Fee started and ended her 
uh, remarks with an appreciation and uh, I think a deep love for the people of South Sudan and I think that is the context within which we want to have this conversation. We come to this from a um, the humanitarian agenda is really focused on how can, uh, how can we get better access for humanitarian aid. There, there's a, most estimates put the need in South Sudan as about 60% of the population will need life-saving assistance by the end of, of 2018. And uh, we're, we're talking about this in the context of a May 8th White House aid review that was called. There was a statement by the White House that on May 8th of this year that called for a comprehensive review and, and said that the U.S. government is committed to saving lives, but really we have to ensure that assistance doesn't uh, contribute to or prolong a conflict. And I think that's the, um, that was an added impetus. We were already planning on having that, and I, I think that really lit a fire. And it was shortly uh, after that that we called Kate Almquist. Help. Did I pronounce the last you name correctly? Okay, thank you. I, I practiced in the mirror. Um, so Kate, Kate was our first call. Uh, Kate, for uh, she probably needs. If you're in this room, you care about South Sudan. And that's generally an assumption I'm going to make. And if you care about South Sudan, you know of Kate and and her um, really excellent work that she's done. She's currently the, the director of the Africa Center for Strategic Sun, uh, Studies, which is an academic institution within the US Department of Defense. She's been in that role since mid-2014, but has been thinking about and caring about South Sudan, Southern Sudan, Sudan since, um, what, the mid-90s? And so it's, it's with um, humility, I think, that we called Kate and said, Kate, we need to do something on this. We have this platform, this humanitarian agenda. South Sudan's really not getting the attention that it deserves despite this incredible humanitarian need. And there are all these access um, issues that we're thinking of. So Kate, thank you so much for being here. And if you could just kick us off uh, by maybe re um, reflecting on what the ambassador said, but also just how are you thinking about these issues of humanitarian access and generally moving the humanitarian conversation forward. You, you think a lot about the politics, you think about the geopolitics and the regional politics, and so if you could provide a, a good framework for us to um, continue this conversation, we'd be grateful. Well, um, thank you, Errol, and thank you to CSIS for convening this uh, forum and this discussion. Uh, I think it's critically important as we're in the fifth year of uh, conflict now uh, in the uh, current iteration of uh, civil war in, in South Sudan. Uh, and in fact, uh, humanitarian uh, uh, conditions uh, continue to deteriorate and, and to worsen. And, and so I think the core challenge uh, to us all uh, is uh, to really um, uh, reflect and to try to understand, to, to diagnose why is that uh, the case? You know, what are the drivers of the conflict uh, that are you know, perpetuating uh, and uh, deepening the crisis? Uh, and how uh, is the response uh, uh, working? Uh, what's effective and uh, where do we find uh, challenges and uh, impediments uh, to our ability to provide the life-saving assistance that's so vital to, to, to keep uh, South Sudanese uh, afloat until there is a political uh, dispensation that uh, uh, really addresses the root causes of the violence taking place in the country. And so I guess my first point uh, that I'd like uh, uh, to, to follow on Ambassador Fee's comments, uh, just to say that you know, the, the real objective, and I hope the focus of our conversation can be on how to achieve better humanitarian outcomes for the people of South Sudan. Uh, and uh, we're challenged by that to figure out what are the metrics for humanitarian outcomes. You know, when we look at the macro level indicators uh, for South Sudan, you know, the story is, uh, is pretty bad, uh, and year after year, you know, it gets worse. You know, but we're uh, challenged uh, because our data is pretty poor, you know, point of fact, you know, and we need to understand uh, why is that the case you know, in terms of uh, what humanitarian agencies and uh, uh, analysis is able to tell us about uh, food security, about malnutrition, uh, about mortality, uh, about other key indicators of uh, the conditions that uh, people are, are living in in South Sudan. Uh, there's a, a forthcoming report uh, from the Feinstein Center that I want to give a little shout out to, to that hopefully will be available uh, maybe even later this week, uh, really looking at some of the data collection challenges uh, that we have 
you know, uh, in South Sudan you know, right now, and you know, the gaps in our data, you know, the problems with the quality of data, you know, the polarization of uh, data on humanitarian indicators, you know, these uh, are, are critical you know, uh, things for us to focus on if we're really going to um, understand where you know, this very massive response that the international community, <coughs> the United States uh, in particular, has mounted you know, uh, through many brave uh, individuals uh, out on the ground delivering assistance. The metrics for our success cannot be you know, the dollars uh, we spend uh, or uh, the degree of access uh, that uh, we think we have. It really needs to be on the humanitarian outcome that results from that. That to me is the key. Uh, is life getting better or is life getting worse uh, for people in South Sudan? Uh, and there are many ways to try and pull apart that question. I think part of that is recognizing that humanitarian needs are driven by conflict. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, we have a, an infographic uh, uh, on the Africa Center website that, that looks at uh, the FuseNet map from October of 2013, uh, so just prior to the outbreak of the Civil War. Uh, and uh, uh, over time, uh, we've updated it uh, uh, to show the current uh, FuseNet uh, projections for, for food insecurity uh, in the country. Again, recognizing that the data is uh, challenged, uh, but uh, progressively we go from uh, a situation of, of nearly uh, zero acute food insecurity in the country uh, uh, just prior to the outbreak of the conflict uh, to a situation that uh, most probably is widespread famine, uh, truth be told, uh, uh, across much of the country. Uh, and, and that's political uh, and that's conflict driven. And yes, there is a complex array of factors uh, that uh, add to that, uh, but, but we need to recognize that. Uh, and I, I think uh, to pick up on a point that Ambassador Fee uh, mentioned as well, yeah, you know, this conflict is a conflict waged against the people of South Sudan. We have numerous uh, 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 human rights reports uh, that document this in grotesque and horrifying detail. Uh, this is virtually genocide. It's ethnic cleansing, it's clearing of populations, uh, and for us to not appreciate uh, that uh, putting a scarce resource, uh, any kind of assistance, uh, into uh, uh, such a resource scarce and politicized uh, environment where the belligerents are using the civilian population as part of their military strategy, uh, it, it behooves us to understand how aid is being used by those belligerents because it is being used. Yeah, and there are some great reports that are you know, trying to document this and you know, put it into the context, in fact, of the history of South Sudan, you know, which uh, uh, has for decades, uh, sadly, you know, been in need of humanitarian assistance and where we have seen belligerents use uh, humanitarian assistance uh, as part of their political and military strategies for you know, controlling populations and resources. Yeah, and so we have to, to, to be savvy about that and to, to really understand what the dynamics around the delivery of assistance is within the context of the conflict dynamics and a conflict that is being waged against you know, the civilian population. Yeah, and then finally, I'll just uh, offer that uh, uh, I think all of this suggests that uh, we really need to look at risk management you know, and how we better you know, deal with uh, the trade-offs uh, in, the, in uh, attempting to reach as many people as possible uh, with life-saving assistance. Uh, uh, this is one of the costliest humanitarian operations uh, on the planet. Uh, uh, certainly the United States has put uh, uh, billions and billions of dollars uh, into this uh, program. Uh, it's the costliest in terms of uh, lives of humanitarian aid workers. Uh, and that means uh, we should be continuously challenged to see how can we make it more effective. How do we get uh, the return uh, that we're seeking in terms of humanitarian outcomes uh, for the size of, of the need that exists uh, and uh, the amount of resource uh, that we're, we're dedicating to that? Uh, there's no perfect answers here, but uh, it does, uh, to me, all suggest that we really need to, to rethink uh, our paradigm for delivery of uh, humanitarian assistance to look at all the options uh, for how we uh, understand uh, the political realities of assistance uh, uh, inside uh, South Sudan. Uh, I'm not arguing that we should cut assistance, uh, just to be clear. Uh, I know that uh, uh, this uh, conversation becomes fraught quickly in the context of the assistance review. Uh, it can sound like that, uh, but uh, the key question is, uh, what are the outcomes we're getting for our assistance and how do we better uh, uh, deal with uh, the belligerents, uh, the government uh, in this case, 
uh, most importantly, you know, because of the dominant control they have over the country and because of its responsibility as the so-called government, you know, how do we better deal with the government in, in our delivery of uh, assistance uh, for the people of South Sudan? And I think that we wanted to talk about what are the tools in our toolbox um, to, you know, what are the pain points in ensuring greater humanitarian access? And I, I think um, cutting off aid, I, I think that that's not what this conversation is about, and I, I agree with you. I, but I think it's worth considering what some of the other tools are. What are the sticks and the carrots that are going to actually bring uh, people to the table, and, and from a more historical context, are there examples of these types of, um, uh, you know, you're one of the foremost global experts on Sudan and South Sudan, and, and so are there some examples of how this has worked in the past um, where the, this confluence of political and humanitarian access has, has resulted in better outcomes for, for people? Well, I, I think again to echo Ambassador Fee, and uh, you know, I, to her credit, uh, during her time there, I think she exerted leadership uh, as the United States has done in the past. I see Ambassador Hume is in the audience uh, with us, and uh, I had the pleasure to work with him uh, uh, on both Darfur and you know, South Sudan during the interim period. And I think we have experience uh, when the United States, uh, as the lead donor you know, in this uh, particular uh, two countries now, uh, uh, says, uh, you know, uh, we are not going to tolerate uh, certain behavior uh, and uh, certain uh, actions, uh, and we put the weight uh, of uh, the United States behind that. Yeah, uh, we can change behavior, mm. uh, but uh, that requires uh, um, some uh, uh, toughness uh, on our part, uh, some difficult uh, calls uh, to be made, uh, and uh, we have to actually stand by our words if we're uh, mm. uh, uh, going to ha not uh, continue to feed the culture of dependency and uh, impunity that uh, uh, now I, I think we're seeing uh, has uh, um, uh, come yeah, uh, it is, is a grand part of the problem here that uh, uh, in terms of the, the current level of you know, uh, uh, humanitarian distress in, in the country. So we, we have a, uh, a responsibility uh, as the, I think the donors uh, you know, to provide uh, the buffer you know, for uh, humanitarian agencies that are uh, working to implement assistance uh, in very difficult circumstances and very dangerous circumstances you know, uh, to really um, uh, play the heavy, uh, so to speak, uh, with, uh, with the government and with the opposition and other uh, armed actors you know, that may be uh, the specific uh, cause of, of a problem. But if we're not unified uh, in, in, our, uh, uh, in our positions in that regard, uh, then you know, I, uh, the, the, the program is too large, uh, there's too much uh, resource there uh, for uh, one uh, principled stand uh, to take effect if, yeah. uh, if other parts of, uh, of the humanitarian operation are, are accepting you know, really conditions that they should never have to accept. Mm. Uh, let me just say that from my time as a USA director uh, in uh, Sudan and, and South Sudan, uh, and from working on this uh, 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 for the last uh, 20 or so years, uh, what the government in Juba uh, has uh, put upon the humanitarian community uh, is uh, in many ways worse than anything the government of Sudan did uh, as we were seeking to respond uh, to their denial of uh, aid and access uh, to South Sudan. Hmm. Uh, and so I just find it unfathomable that uh, we can't uh, stand up to, uh, to this government in Juba uh, and in a more consistent way uh, further uh, to, I think, a number of uh, the experiences that, uh, that Molly had while she was there. Uh, but, but it requires uh, um, clarity uh, on our part and it requires us taking some tough positions uh, that, that can be challenging in the immediate moment. Tough positions indeed. Um, Ambassador Fee mentioned uh, several really prestigious humanitarian organizations in her opening remarks, and one of them being the Norwegian Refugee Council, and we're uh, really honored to have Joel Charney here, who is the executive director of uh, Norwegian Refugee Council USA. He comes at not only South Sudan, but the humanitarian world uh, with an incredible wealth of experience and knowledge. Uh, previous to this position, uh, Joel, you were Vice President for Humanitarian Policy and Practice at Interna Interaction, which for those that don't know, Interaction is the premier NGO forum 
here in uh, the United States. And I, I can't think of any better person to be on the stage right now to, to be representing the humanitarian uh, implementer perspective. And, and so I'm sure you'll, you'll have that hat on, but also if you could um, put on the, the general as the, the hat of someone who has worked in and around these issues of humanitarian access more broadly. And so we'd love your, your thoughts on, on either what they said, uh, Kate and Ambassador Fee, but just generally how you're thinking about these issues. Yeah. Thanks, Harold, and uh, thanks, Kimberly, and thanks to Ofta for sponsoring this. And um, yeah, I just appreciate being on the, on the panel and being given this opportunity. Um, these are tough issues. I mean, I'm, I'm here, I think, you know, on the one hand, sure, speaking for NRC, but trying to speak more broadly on behalf of the, uh, of the humanitarian NGO community. And there are no, I mean, I'm really wrestling, Errol, with this whole issue of how, how we can be more specific. And, you know, what, what's the, you know, what are the, the three points that would, would make our program more, more effective? I, I think it's the right question. And honestly, I'm not sure that there's, a, there's an easy answer to that. Why? Because the fundamental driver of the humanitarian challenges in South Sudan relate to political issues and a longstanding political con conflict that we have no control over. And the ambassador and, and, and Kate both, uh, both alluded to that. So I think the, the danger is, and I'm not accusing either of you of doing this, but I think the, the danger is that given the complete political impasse, given where we are, well, what's in our toolbox? Mm. Oh, the handy humanitarian sector into which we're pouring hundreds of millions of dollars. Let's see if we can use the humanitarian aspect of our engagement in, in South Sudan to further political goals that are important and, and legitimate. So I think the first point is, as tempting as that is, we need to kind of avoid that temptation. Okay, so we therefore, as humanitarians wanting to be more effective, we ask ourselves, well, what, what, is, the, what is the way to do that under, under current circumstances? And I think what we've come up with so far is inadequate, but maybe notionally some, some steps in the, in the right direction. So one of, it, one of them might be to be just more, more conscious of local realities, more present, more able to be with the people of, of South Sudan <clears throat> in a meaningful way. Now that involves taking very serious risks. Uh, South Sudan is the most dangerous country for humanitarian workers in the, in the world. And that danger is being incurred primarily by South Sudanese and other staff from the, from the wider Africa region. And it, to, to, in, in other words, the, the focus on, on staff security in, in South Sudan arose from that grotesque attack in, in, in Juba on expatriate workers. Mm. But the daily reality is it's the South Sudanese themselves who are, who are taking the risks. So it's very easy in a way to say, <clears throat> let's be present, let's focus at, at community level, but we, we need to acknowledge that there, are, that there are risks involved in that. Nonetheless, I think what, I think a way forward potentially is to be more local, more grounded, maybe do more cash assistance. And there was one reason we were discussing earlier, why is this operation so huge? Well, there's a massive air operation involved in flying stuff all over the country. 
Are there places in South Sudan where there is need, but where that kind of assistance may not be necessary? Is there a way to put cash into local markets or into local communities that therefore involves less expense and you know, potentially a little bit less overall risk in terms of how to, to do the programming? The other thing, the other aspect of local, I think, is, um, is being, having the external agencies, uh, the, the you know, NRC, as mentioned, CRS, um, you know, Concern Worldwide, and so on, to, for us to be more, more unified and in a constant dialogue at the community level. I, I mean, the, I'd say the national red line discussion, I will admit, has been a total failure in the sense that we say, you know, don't you dare do that and then the government does it, or the belligerents do it, and then we continue doing the same thing regardless. I think that we need, we need to acknowledge and we need to own. But there are numerous examples at local level where the red line discussion has actually worked, hmm. where we've actually respected that, red, where, where we've said, you've done that. I mean, the example my colleague cited, um, when we spoke yesterday is um, a, an example last year where basically the local commander took all the vehicles that were available in, uh, in a particular community. And I won't mention the agency, but you know, there's, a, I guess, a famous photo of you know, like a machine gun mounted on the back of, a, of an agency vehicle. Well, the agencies came together and in a unified way said, we're walking unless you get, we get our vehicles back and the vehicles were returned. Now that's, a, I think, in the grand scheme of things, a rather trivial example, but I think that, that kind of effort to, to work together at, at local level is, um, is essential. But on the, what I'm really struggling with is the, the bigger question of is our work fundamentally fueling the war? Are we fueling the conflict? And you know, perhaps you in the audience have some thoughts on this. I, I mean, the, the difficulty is it, it's very easy for me representing a, a humanitarian organization. And I stress that on the, on the spectrum from pure development um, to you know, the ICRC and the MSFs of the world, NRC is involved much less on the development side of things than on the humanitarian. So we're not an ICRC or an MSF, but fundamentally we work in conflict settings to bring humanitarian relief. So we're on that side of the spectrum. And so therefore it's, it's relatively easy for me in any time I'm pushed to cite the humanitarian imperative. What do you want us to do in, in South Sudan? You say we're fueling the conflict. Do you want us to, to walk away? Do you want us to cut our funding? You know, do you want us to, to no longer work there, potentially literally jeopardizing the lives of, um, in our case, uh, thousands of people, not, you know, not millions, but thousands? You know, it, so it, it, I can always play that card. Um, but on the, other, on the other hand, we do want to be more effective and, and more impactful with, uh, with the resources that we, that we have. So, I mean, I, I think we're open to any discussion and any free advice about how to do this better in, in, such, a, in such a difficult circumstance. But again, I, I think what we want to avoid is an effort by at a at a global political level or at a donor level to kind of use humanity you know the pain points i i don't think humanitarian organizations should be part of a pain point process you know i i think we should be part of a process that says how do we help the beleaguered people of sudan better and and let's find pain points that are more political and diplomatic 
rather than you know trying to use humanitarian assistance as a way to you know to draw you know to send a message. Uh, and we we've heard a bit of that I think recently uh, from from this administration, um, you know, notably from from Ambassador Haley. Um, that you know that that's something that's really tough. We we would push back against that kind of approach and, and that kind of discourse where you know we're literally tallying UN votes and then deciding who's going to get our assistance on uh, on on that basis. If we if we are going to be again, Kate, let let's focus on impact and effectiveness. And if that's the conversation. I, I think we can have a potentially productive conversation. And what, uh, you said something that was really interesting that we, we haven't heard yet, which is the, when you talk about national red lines, you're really talking about something that hasn't worked and, and it's been toothless sort of threats or whatever you want to say. But the, the unified, you know, I'm working in Jonglei State or Upper Nile or somewhere, I guess all the states are different now, but um, you know, if we're working in these areas and we collectively draw a red line based on the capture of vehicles or sort of uh, some other assistance, that that actually results in better conditions that create better access. Did I hear that correctly? Is that what you were trying no, to No, absolutely. Get and there, there are a lot of, uh, I, I want to give this specific location because I know there are a lot of, um, Experts on on South Sudan in the in the audience. The the particular example I'm I'm citing was in uh, was in Okobo, mm -hmm. and you know a place where there were five or six organizations working. We were all attacked simultaneously in the same way. Like you wake up one day and whoops, your vehicles have been confiscated. That I think made it a little bit. Of course, vehicles. You know now you're hitting us where it hurts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, so I, I, I think that made it easier to to act um, to act collectively. The other thing, Errol, that I, I think I neglected to say, and again, this came out from the conversation with my uh, with my colleague yesterday, but um, he told me that they're right now in in South Sudan, in in our analysis as NRC, there are only two places where we truly cannot go. Hmm. Um, those being an area outside of, of Wow and an area in, in Yambio in, in Western Equatoria. So I think... The, but that's today. That's what I mean. <laughs> so I mean, but I mean, the, the point is that, yes, it's a shifting environment, but I think the point is that there's... Is access the fundamental problem, or is aid manipulation and the internal politicization of aid the fundamental problem? And I think our argument would be, given you know the the overall access situation, you know, with what's a you know, with so few pure no-go zones, you are prevented from going there. I think our argument would be it's basically how are you effective in an incredibly complicated operating environment as opposed to how can we get more access? I, I think it's the former question that's more fundamental in, um, in, in South Sudan. You, you and some others this morning, uh, we had a private roundtable beforehand and, and it was off the record so I won't attribute it to anybody, but you know there was talk of access not being the, the solutions to access and let's add access that leads to outcomes sure. as a as a takeaway from this conversation. But it's you know, is the conversation about access that leads to better outcomes the same conversation as what to do about capture and diversion and manipulation of aid? Are the are the tools that we potentially have, are those the same tools for those or, or those the same conversations or those separate conversations? I, I think I think they have to be linked. It would be crazy not to not to link them. But I, I think the the question is in places where, and again, when I say we, I mean we collectively, in places that we're working, what are the pressures that we're under mm. and what's preventing us from relieving the suffering of, of people who need our assistance? And that may be an access blockage, 
it may be a diversion issue, you know, it, it may be any number of issues, but I, I don't see any way to have a separate access conversation and then a separate conversation around how the aid is being utilized. Is it really getting to the people that need it in the, in the terms that they, that they you know, Again, the ambassador, you, you started, again, I will all thank you for starting in exactly the right place. The, the question is, the, how do we relieve the unbelievable suffering of the, of the people of, of South Sudan? How can they have agency to solve their, their own problems? And that gets into something maybe I didn't emphasize enough, which is the, the there are gonna be places in South Sudan right now where there's a potential to do small scale development work. We should absolutely be seizing those opportunities to the extent that that's possible. Because wouldn't it be nice if we build resilience to future, uh, I, I know you, you have, uh, you love that word, resilience. I love that uh, word, it's my favorite <laughs> word. But you notice it's like, it's kind of dropped off the map. I mean, resilience is so 2014. Um, <laughs> You can tell me now what the word is. I've lost track, but... Uh, well, I think this yeah. is a really nice segue into something else that I, I really think is critical to talk about, which is we talk about South Sudan nationally and as, as a country, and I think, Ambassador Fee, if you could just spend a couple minutes talking about is South Sudan, is, is the access and better humanitarian outcomes conversation a South Sudan-wide conversation, or is this much more of a fractured, it, some things may work in some places while they don't work in other places, and we have better access in some places than other places. What, can you talk a little bit about the current state of the conflict? It's a little bit of a leading question, but being a little bit more fractured rather than a sort of, uh, I think a, a lot of people on the outside may think that there's uh, one actor and there's another actor that's going against and, and there's this sort of sim simplistic understanding of what's going on. And if you could paint us a little bit more of the complicated picture and then maybe I'll ask Kate and, and Joel to, to comment and, and elaborate on how, given that fractured nature, uh, you know, what are some things that, that may work in some places that don't work in other places? Sure, but first I'd, I'd like to say um, that I'm sure that Joel and Kate feel this way, and I know that you feel this way too, Errol. It's really regrettable that you, we don't have a single Sudanese here. No, totally. Um, yeah. and, uh, and one of the challenges of this conflict is that I hate, I really physically hate being in the position where it appears that I care more about the plight of the people of South Sudan than other South Sudanese. Which and I don't true. mean to yeah. suggest that, and I, I think it's so important that I want to explicitly say that on, beha on behalf of all of us. Um, so, and of course, South Sudanese would be better placed to discuss uh, their current environment and their own interactions than outsiders. Yeah. Um, and, and so I will be limited in what I can say by the fact that I am an outsider. Um, but what I, I would say is it is true in a sense that that conflict has fragmented in terms of um, uh, particularly the opposition. Uh, but uh, these are communities that know how to communicate with each other, that know each other. Um, and I think we have run a danger in our analysis in overemphasizing the, 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 the sort of the way the, frag the conflict is fragmented. Mm. So that is definitely a fact, and I'll come back to that. But one of the challenges we also have as outsiders, with the exception of a few people in this room, and I mean that with all love and affection, um, we are dealing with leadership that has been in place for decades. But we all change. And I think, as a, particularly in the United States, and I have said this about my beloved State Department, we are very bad at knowledge management. And uh, many of us are vulnerable to the history starts when I step off the plane syndrome. Um, so we're dealing with people who get all these you know, excited, enthusiastic, I'm gonna come and help this conflict, people who get off the plane, and they just see us coming and they manipulate us and play us. So that is really a factor we have to be conscious of as we try and, and solve the challenge. 
Um, what's different now uh, since the collapse of the ceasefire in 2016, and Joel, to, to, to move the conversation, I just want to say I agree with you. We're, we're never going to come up with a perfect solution. We have a lot of people who are very bright and who've tried to work this problem for a long time, and there's no immediate solution. Um, so we're talking about improving it on the margins. But try not to go to that sort of um, uh, sort of very black and white binary, well, if we, if, if we don't do it, then people will die, right? Then you're playing into their, we can do anything to these people and they'll still give us aid. So what, what can we do? So in July 2016, people may recall, WFP had a large warehouse in Juba. And after the, immediately after the conflict, it was completely ransacked. And I looked up uh, the numbers. So there were 4,600 megatons of food stolen, which is $28 million, and it could have fed 220,000 people for a month. Plus, they stole everything. They literally stole everything in the, in the warehouse. So that was a tragic consequence of the fighting. But what very wise South Sudanese said to me later, in fact, that the SPLA took most of that food, and that, and that their argument was that it mitigated the subsequent looting in the town of Juba, which there was still terrible uh, looting, because they had that food, um, and, it, and it, which they considered the, the spoils of, of war from, from that point in time. So aid is, is part of the conflict. There are also really difficult conundrums. Um, uh, the uh, ethnic cleansing that Kate referred to. Uh, so that's what's different now in 2016. So the war has spread to Equatoria. Uh, in, the first, in the first part of 2014 and 2015, it was mostly in the greater Upper Nile region of the country. Uh, so we saw the de destruction of Bor, again, the destruction of Malakal, uh, the dis destruction in Unity State. But what happened after 2016 is it moved down into Equatoria, um, and it also moved into western Bahar Gazelle, into the um, well-established town of Wau, where there was a multi-ethnic uh, community. Um, and that was a major market town. So Joel, that's a challenge for the cash because the mm. market economy has collapsed. I mean, of course, in every, everything in South Sudan, there's a counter example, but that's, I think, been a real challenge with the idea mm -hmm. of injecting cash because things can't get in because the roads into the country are from Equatoria. That's been insecure. And WOW was the major anchor you know, in that part of the country, and it's been very hard to get aid there. So I think in terms of the current situation, Joel, that's what's different now than what we saw in, in 2014 and 2015. And as I've been told by South Sudanese and other experts, and there are people in this room who are much smarter than I about this, but Equatoria, first of all, was a place where you could produce food. So in fact, clever development folks like Kate would buy food in Equatoria and move it throughout the country. And it was also a place where you could transit um, from uh, other parts of Africa, from Kenya and Uganda, and, br and bring in food. And that, that lifeline, if you will, has been severely disrupted. And that was what the, just to go back to what the United States was doing when we were pushing the Regional Protection Force in 2016, it was to sort of stabilize Equatoria so that you could, you could bring in aid and assistance. So I think that's one of the things uh, that's different. Um, but uh, I think I'll stop there, but it's just sort of that, so yeah. now you have really the in, entire country engulfed in some sense uh, of conflict, and of course it does move uh, depending, and there was a lot of pressure by the government to go after uh, strongholds of uh, Dr. Mashar's area, particularly in Unity, where there was the feud between Taban Dengai and Riyak Mashar mm -hmm. being played out, and you mentioned Dakobo, so they were moving uh, east towards Dakobo and Pagak to try and regain dominance, uh, again, in areas which were traditionally held uh, yeah. by Dr. Mashar. But uh, to me, the difference really is, is the loss of Equatoria mm -hmm. um, and the dis destabilization in WOW, where there's just been her horrific violence. Um, so you get into these problems where WFP had a problem in WOW, you may recall, where some of their workers were killed, some of them were detained, and they actually said to the government, we are going to suspend assistance because we can't operate in this area until you make changes. And that, and that was successful, ultimately. Um, uh, but in this very, very bitter civil war, um, they are accusing uh, organizations as esteemed as N NRC and WFP and ICRC of being partisan in the conflict, which is totally specious.
No, as you right. probably know, I mean, our, yeah. our country yeah. director was, um, yeah. was PNG. I know, I spent a lot of time That's right, to get in, uh, in November <laughs> of, uh, of 2016. Yeah. Yeah. And we never found out why, never. Right. To this day, we have, so I mean, there's no transparency whatsoever in terms of even what the accusation might be. It's just, you leave. And there's no, to this day, there's never been, and we continue to operate there and have a new country director, but we never found out why Victor was expelled. And, and I do want to um, just come back to your point. I mean, not having Luca on the stage right. or, or a South Sudanese representative was uh, it was something. As Kimberly really knows from day one, I was very we were very focused on this, and um, I think we we decided to continue with this conversation because partly because we wanted to draw attention to a, a conflict and, and sort of an issue set that's not getting enough attention in our uh, opinion, and also. We are talking to a certain extent about U.S. and non-South Sudanese tools that, that can be used. And I think within that perspective, I'd love to hear, uh, Kate, if you could talk a little bit about what some of the multilateral and, and, and regional efforts are um, to not just resolve the conflict, but, but create uh, an environment in which uh, more humanitarian access is, is a reality. Uh, I know that there's been some action in, in the UN Security Council, and I know there's been some regional um, action as well, so I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks, Errol. I guess if I can uh, jump Please. into the conversation Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. in terms of you know, achieving better humanitarian outcomes and better political outcomes, right? I mean, we have two you know, very fundamental tracks uh, you know, that you know, are both challenged uh, at this point in time you know, in terms of uh, uh, effect uh, for the people of South Sudan. You know, on the humanitarian front and the conversation we're having here, you know, I agree, you know, we want to keep uh, the conversation on you know, how to achieve, the, as I said at the outset, you know, better you know, humanitarian outcomes, uh, better you know, conditions for people to live in in South Sudan. We have to do that recognizing there is a political economy you know, in which uh, assistance you know, uh, very much uh, is uh, not just part of the picture, it's almost the whole picture, uh, mm. just in terms of the economic distress uh, uh, of South Sudan right now. Uh, and uh, there are any number of uh, uh, dilemmas and conundrums that that poses for you know, how to deliver humanitarian assistance when you know, the humanitarian operation is the only source of foreign exchange in the country. Uh, and when uh, you know uh, the private sector, such as it is, in you know, in Juba, in the capital city, is controlled by you know, the dominant uh, group controlling you know, the government right now. And so there are, there are levels of you know, complexity to the political economy that uh, I think is fundamentally challenging and you know, it goes back to uh, my point at the beginning about risk management. You know, that means we have to have our eyes wide open, we have to have clear uh, analysis of uh, who's in control of, of wh what resources, what the power relationships are, you know, who's connected to whom, you know, and to be aware of how uh, externally provided assistance is feeding into that, you know, and mm. you know, to, to take decisions wisely, you know, knowing that we can't mitigate everything, you know, but uh, we could be a lot more you know, cognizant of uh, how they're using these, uh, uh, they're seeing these resource flows. Because mm. these stories that you both just told, uh, you know, just reaffirms that you know, the actors themselves, the government uh, and uh, opposition, uh, other you know, belligerents, uh, see aid as political. They see it political. So, so that's one thing. Um, on, on, the, on the political process uh, side of things, we have a whole other event uh, on that. <laughs> Uh, yes. uh, which uh, this conversation uh, is, is not necessarily meant to be, but it, it is But I think they're related, right? I mean, absolutely, uh, yeah. and uh, it is uh, always a, a challenge to find uh, the right uh, balance of um, uh, what is needed uh, to move the political uh, uh, calculus uh, to a, a better outcome. Uh, we want a resolution to the conflict uh, and an end to the violence. Uh, and I don't think that's a rearranging of the deck chairs of the power sharing arrangement that has failed hmm. uh, spectacularly multiple times now. Uh, so we're not on a path uh, to resolution of the conflict. Uh, so further to Ambassador Fee's point that this conflict is not going away uh, and uh, uh, we're not uh, about to see a resolution to that. Uh, that means you know, even more so on the humanitarian side that we have to be mindful of the political dynamics uh, of the assistance. Uh, uh, that's going in and of this massive amount of need that, that continues because the conflict and, and the violence and the, the political 
you know, uh, challenge is, is there. Um, I, I, I think it's uh, uh, sadly the case that um, uh, the people of South Sudan are the last uh, consideration uh, in terms of uh, the current uh, peace process uh, and uh, what uh, the region uh, uh, has arrived at uh, for a variety of reasons uh, in terms of, again, uh, re-looking at the, the power sharing formula and uh, uh, the wealth sharing formula. Uh, I mean, it's really a competition over uh, who can control uh, uh, populations, who can control uh, land in a certain way, who controls whether assistance uh, comes mm -hmm. in or out uh, at this point. Uh, I see no prospect uh, that the United States or any of the other major donors are going to put uh, financial resources behind the current formula that's on the table today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the United States has invested incredibly uh, in uh, South Sudan uh, uh, for many, many, many years, but uh, specifically over the course of the uh, Comprehensive Peace Agreement uh, process, the interim period leading up to the referendum on self-determination and, you know, since independence in, in 2011. And uh, the level of resource needed now to pull South Sudan uh, out of uh, its crisis, uh, not just to continue delivering humanitarian assistance at uh, the level of, of need we see, uh, is far beyond uh, uh, anything I think uh, uh, we could see uh, uh, in our current foreign assistance uh, reality uh, right now. Uh, and so that's really challenging. Yeah. Uh, the United States is not going to be there, uh, most likely uh, in the way that we have in the past, in the way the presumption is uh, on parties, uh, uh, and uh, the way the people of South Sudan need in terms of uh, uh, some kind of recovery and uh, pathway forward. Uh, if uh, if the, the uh, political reality aligns uh, in a different way, uh, maybe uh, there would be some hope uh, uh, for some investment uh, uh, in reconstruction and uh, and an economic bailout uh, for for the people of South Sudan. But you know, but the current formula inspires no confidence uh, uh, for doing that. Yeah, so you know, that I think just puts the, the onus uh, back on the humanitarian operation uh, and back on this uh, uh, fundamental question of what is the diagnosis, right? What is the nature of the challenge you know, that you know, leads to this um, uh, overall uh, worsening of the humanitarian situation uh, for the people of South Sudan? You know, where can we gain traction uh, in humanitarian indicators? How can we build out from that? Can we preserve, you know, uh, uh, even bubbles of uh, pockets uh, where where we have uh, uh, some uh, effective results? How do we get better data so we know what's happening, right? Uh, what the level of need is and what uh, uh, the level of effect is uh, of assistance, uh, so that we can make you know, smarter, wiser decisions about allocation of resources. Again, being cognizant of uh, the political uh, lenses through which uh, the recipients uh, mm -hmm. and, and those controlling uh, uh, the ability to provide that assistance are, are looking at. And maybe that's an opportunity for, again, uh, in the current construct, you don't see a, an opportunity for, for U.S. leadership, but I think that the U.S. is so thoroughly invested in the success of South Sudan and not just independence, not just the comprehensive peace agreement, but continuing on. And so I'd like to, I'd like to end my questioning because I do want to turn it to the, to the audience and I'd like to end my sort of uh, moderation of this panel by making just a, a plea and a call for, for greater U.S. leadership on this. And I know that we're going to be at CSIS thinking a lot more about this. There are smart people in this town, in Juba, and all over the world that are thinking about this. I know Peyton at USIP and, and a whole bunch of other people are really putting all of their brain cells to try to make this happen. And so, again, I think this panel probably raised more questions than it answered, and that's, I think, okay. Um, and I think the onus is on us to keep the attention on this issue set uh, and, and find ways that we, the United States, can actually be a productive part of whatever the solution looks like uh, in the future. And so with that note, I do want to turn it, uh, we have a few minutes left, and the audience has been so patient. Um, I will ask, uh, I think I'm going to take two questions first, and I'll bundle them. And I'm going to ask that you state your, stand up, state your name, and uh, who you're representing today and then try to make the question brief and have it end in a question mark. Um, so we'll start with this gentleman up here. Uh, we'll, we'll get you a microphone here one second. Uh, yeah, go ahead. 
This gentleman is going to have a microphone for you. Thanks for being here. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Gordon Boy. I'm the charge of the Republic of South Sudan, United States. Thank you for being so here. So my question, because uh, the discussion is very good, but there are some uh, th issues that I want to raise because uh, Ambassador didn't talk about them. The American, we signed MOU in 2012, where we, uh, the South Sudan government cannot charge American NGOs yeah. any fees, right? Mm -hmm. And that one is implemented. I think the ambassador is a witness. Mm -hmm. uh, in regard to our problem with some American NGOs, there is a case here, the guy called Domingo Ruiz. I think you know that, Domingo, working for Food and Agriculture Organization, and he was PNG in 2017 mm -hmm. because he was linked with the rebels. We shared the same intelligence with U.S. intelligences, even the U.S. Embassy is aware of that. There was another case, Safe World, American NGO, the same thing. So what I was trying to say to Joel is that if you need evidence, we can provide that. But we did the same thing to the U.S. government. Any American NGO suspected by, by our uh, intelligences, they provide the evidence. I think, Ambassador, you are aware of this case. Because this guy was also, at some point, an American embassy security agent and later on you work with F FAO. So the other thing is the Kobo incident. Uh, Kobo is under the rebels, I think you know that, right? So there are cases where American NGOs are involved in certain legal activities. Whenever our intelligences have evidence, the first thing we do is we share it with the American intelligences, and we did it more than five times. So this thing is not being reflected, well, of course, for some American intelligence, they can keep them as secrets. But if, uh, I mean, uh, the, as let's say, like this uh, NGO community are coming out, accusing our government, oh, you are doing this or doing that. Of course, we have been very transparent because right. we don't charge any American NGO any fee. But we have very cases where we have evidence. And if any one of you would want, in three days, I can supply that evidence to you why we PNG those NGOs. Thank you. Thank you very much for it. I'll take one more question and then I think uh, we'll get some responses on that. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Let's uh, wait for a microphone. John's got one right there. Uh, please stand and... Of course, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Amal Abukar, and I work for Cape Institute, which is the, is the only research institute focused on the Horn of Africa and, and the Middle East. So uh, I've been working mainly on focus on the Middle East as well as the Horn of Africa. Uh, I'm actually from Somalia. Um, so basically, my question is, uh, facilitating of humanitarian assistance require obviously um, understanding with all stake uh, stakeholders. And the region, uh, last month there was a um, an major talks, peace talks, um, South Sudan in, held in Ethiopia. Um, but here my question will be, um, has anyone been held uh, to account for the deterioration of humanitarian uh, situation in South Sudan? Mm. That's my question, actually. Thank you. And I think you're also a Rotary Peace Fellow. Hello, yeah, yes. Right. Thank you for being here. Um, so let's take those two questions. And if we have time, I'll, I'll get to a couple. But maybe um, Ambassador Fee and then Joel can respond to our um, colleague from the South Sudanese Embassy. And uh, then, Kate, uh, maybe I'll ask you and to, to respond to the second question. I think it's very important that folks understand that the government of South Sudan is now considering a finance bill which would again introduce the concept of raising uh, uh, the fees on humanitarian workers hmm. uh, and would also uh, attempt to tax them. Um, so this goes to my mind to uh, uh, what Kate just uh, referred to in terms of the political economy um, and that, that the government is desperately searching for sources of revenue and they see the humanitarian community as the, the fat calf. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, although it is quite true, as the charge pointed out, and I thank you for uh, reminding folks, that in 2012 the U.S. government concluded an agreement with the government of South Sudan, which we try and do in all uh, countries where we are providing substantial humanitarian and development assistance, that due to the generosity of the American taxpayer, we don't expect the government which is receiving uh, that assistance to tax us for this assistance which is designed to address emergencies and help develop the country. Uh, nonetheless, um, American implementing partners have been taxed by the government. Um, there was uh, a unity of purpose, which is why I'm big on collective action, to reject an initial effort 
2017 to charge each humanitarian worker $10,000. Yeah. Uh, that was so ridiculous uh, that it, uh, it received the support of the entire international community. Uh, so the government abandoned $10,000, but then came back uh, with lower fees, which were still at 4,000, as Kate is reminding me, uh, which uh, were, are still in, in my mind, and I think to the mind of most members of Congress, unacceptable. Uh, so one area in which we can look concretely in the near term for the international community to remain engaged is to um, say that the, we do not believe it's acceptable to tax um, this uh, uh, assistance that we're providing to, uh, to help the people of South Sudan during this acute crisis. Mm -hmm. Joel? Uh, I mean, what do you want me to say? I mean, our, our country director was declared persona non grata. He was given 24 hours to leave the country. We are still based in Juba, and to this day we've received no explanation as to why he was asked to leave. If you'd like to look into the situation, we would welcome that, but we've had no answer from the government. We try to maintain constructive relations with the authorities in Juba. We work widely in the country, including in areas that are controlled by the opposition. That's how we operate as a humanitarian agency. I, I mean, there's really nothing else to say. And, and you operate quite effectively all over the country in my, uh, in my recollection. And I also think that your guest house was right around the corner from where our guest house was. <laughs> and I may or may not have used your internet sometime in Juba. Well, so uh, thank you for that. Of course we share our internet. Uh, well. but, but Errol, I think yes. more importantly, the people of South Sudan know the NRC. Yes, the NRC has right. been a friend for decades to the people of South Sudan. And they, I cannot imagine, uh, would support the idea that NRC is, is a political actor in any way uh, and that should be pressured uh, in any way, given the, the kind of sacrifice and support that you provided for decades. Right. I think yeah. that's really the important point. Absolutely. Kate, either on that one or, or especially getting to our uh, well, if I, I'll just pick up on the uh, accountability question because there's been far too little accountability uh, to date. Uh, this is uh, back to the culture of impunity point that invested the immense justice questions. You know, further to Ambassador Fee's point in, in terms of the spread of the conflict, you know, I, you know, this is uh, you know, truly you know, uh, uh, a situation of, you know, uh, uh, of historic uh, significance for the people of South Sudan in terms of the level of distress. Uh, that is wrought on the country and on the civilian population. Uh, and I, I don't uh, think that even uh, back uh, uh, into the, the second civil war of 1983 to 2005, you know, we ever saw this level of uh, conflict and violence uh, so pervasive across the countryside uh, uh, in any one moment. Certainly you know, in you know, different parts of the, uh, the country you know, previously, but um, uh, never uh, as all-encompassing as it is now, and uh, including the Equatorias, you know, which should be uh, a productive uh, region for, for food and, and other you know, resources for people of South Sudan. So. I, I want to ask a follow-up question to that, Kate, uh, about um, are, are those types of accountability mechanisms actually useful for creating greater humanitarian access? So, so do, they have, do they have specific, explicit goals of creating better access and outcomes? And if so, are there examples uh, that that's actually been the case? And, and before you answer that, I just, we're, we're gonna draw this to a, a close, but I would love if all the panelists could think about um, if, if you could leave the audience with one tweet length um, idea of, of how to, th you know, what's one thing that you want them to really take away from this conversation and go home? It could be a question, um, and, and so uh, just be thinking about that. But in the interim, uh, while you're doing that, Kate, just do these things work? Um, I, I think it's important uh, that we prioritize uh, justice and accountability for justice and accountability. And I think one of the long lessons of, uh, of conflict uh, in uh, South Sudan uh, is that we have overlooked uh, the importance of you know, justice you know, for grievances you know, within communities, between communities, uh, by the state, uh, against the civilian population, you know, in so many different levels and, and ways. 
you know, this was not adequately uh, addressed and dealt with uh, in the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Uh, and uh, uh, going uh, into uh, the uh, phase of independence for South Sudan, uh, and this uh, civil war now since uh, 2013 uh, has just uh, uh, added uh, uh, an immense amount of, of, um, of, of pain and uh, of uh, uh, grievance uh, for the people of South Sudan. That needs to be dealt with for its own sake. If there's yeah. ever to be, you know, the, the social fabric of the country is ever you know, to come back together. And, and frankly, if there to be a logic for a nation state uh, in South Sudan. That's not to question you know, uh, the uh, validity of independence for, for South Sudan, you know, but to say that you know, for South Sudan to cohere you know, across communities uh, and uh, recognizing uh, just how bitter this conflict has uh, become uh, with community against community and uh, ethnic uh, uh, group against ethnic group, you know, we really have to deal with justice for justice sake. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, that can only help to enable uh, humanitarian and economic and uh, uh, other social uh, uh, development needs for the country uh, by doing that. But. Yeah, it's important to keep that uh, uh, prioritized in its right. Mm. Um, Ambassador Fee, any last parting words of wisdom in 280 characters or less? Don't give up. Uh, we still have influence. Uh, we still matter. Um, uh, the people of South Sudan still have capability. Um, and it's worth asking these tough questions and getting to better answers. Mm. Joel? I just think we need to be more agile and more flexible and more community-based. Okay. I, I would say that South Sudan absolutely is a situation that can be turned around. You know, there are political solutions uh, you know, to the conflict there, uh, and uh, there is uh, an incredible wealth uh, of experience and even uh, the resource that we have uh, dedicated right now to South Sudan you know, that could fundamentally make a difference here. You know, yes, there are some regional complications and uh, realities to that, but they're manageable. You know, this is a solvable uh, problem. You know, it is uh, uh, not the, the situation that we have in some other complex humanitarian emergencies where we can't you know, have a win here. And uh, it's incumbent upon all of us uh, to continue to strive for the policy changes that uh, would allow us to see you know, a fundamentally different situation for the people of South Sudan. Thank you to everyone that joined us online, uh, especially those that took time uh, out of your afternoon in South Sudan to, to watch this and be part of this conversation. Um, thank you to all of you that came, and please join me in thanking our panelists. That's a Cambodian thing, you always like...